Open them up to page one. We're going to start in Genesis 126. So while you're turning there, I wanted to start off with a video, but I thought I'd better introduce the video because it's going to, this video is going to feel really different and out of place. This is uh, not a Christian perspective. This video, it's, it's by a theoretical um, physicist and cosmologist. His name is Lawrence Krauss. He was a professor. He taught at Yale University. Most recently, he's taught at Arizona State. He served on the science committee for uh, President Obama several years ago and uh, when Obama was running for office. And I wanted to, uh, I think, I thought it'd be good for us to hear from him. He does say a cuss word in this, so I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I just wanted you to know that it's, it's in there, but I think it'd be worth it for us to kind of hear this narrative, and uh, that'll help us set up where we're going to be tonight in Genesis 1. So let's watch uh, Lawrence Krauss. Did you hear what he said? There's a lot of words in two and a half minutes, but the key phrase that he, he said right in the middle, we make our own purpose. He said some other things. He said, we're here by accident. He said, there's no purpose for our lives except whatever we come up with. He said, there's no purpose in the universe. The results, we, we, we are nothing more than the result of a cosmic accident, but it's a remarkable accident. That was his, what he said. That is our culture's philosophy. And I was actually, I stumbled across this video. I was reading about a 20th century philosopher named Albert Camus. I don't know if some of you have studied him in class. But he believed the same thing, that we are here because of a cosmic accident. And so then he said, because of that, there's no meaning in the universe. So therefore, there's no purpose in the universe. Therefore, there's no meaning in life. There's no purpose in life. And so to quote Camus, he says, he is brave enough to say this, the logical conclusion when there is no meaning is there is only one, this is his quote, there is only one really philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Camus cannot find meaning in anything because everything's an accident, and so he can't find any purpose in the universe or in life. And that's led him to his logical conclusion. Conclusion, is life really worth living? That's our culture's philosophy. One of them. And you can believe that. There are people all over the world that are anchoring their life, they're anchoring their future, their heart on that. That everything's just a remarkable cosmic accident. And they're chaining their hearts to that. And that is the antithesis of Genesis 1. It's the complete opposite of Genesis 1. So you don't have to believe Genesis 1, but I just want to say that if you're, if you're in the camp of, of, of the philosophical, like everything's, everything's meaningless, and we're left to just try to figure it out and come up with our own purpose, then I just want to ask you to, if you could admit that it requires great faith to be in that camp. That everything just accidentally happened. If you, if you read that kind of philosophy, you'll re, you also read that we're nothing more than just really advanced evolution, advanced germs walking around. That's really all that we are. Trying to figure out is there meaning enough to go on. That requires faith to believe that. And then there's this story. There's this story that's remarkable, that has been tested. Everything has been thrown at this story for thousands of years, and it keeps coming. It keeps coming, and people have banked their whole life on this story, and they found it to be true. They found it to be full of hope and full of meaning and full of purpose and passion. This story was written by like 44 different authors over the span of 
1,500 years in different languages, different types of literature that have all come together to tell one story with one main character, Jesus Christ. And it's all cohesive. It all works. It's all telling one story. In my opinion, it takes way more faith to buy into the universe is a cosmic accident than the faith required to believe in this. So that's to kind of set up the idea in the culture that there is no meaning except what we can come up with in ourselves. And then the idea in Genesis 1 that we can anchor ourselves to that God determines meaning and God determines purpose. Okay, Genesis 1 verse 26. Uh, Nate last week left off in verse 25. Verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So here's what's going on. Last week, Nate talked about, he walked us through creation, and we got through halfway through day six. And so we, um, we talked last week about how God created light, and before he created the sun or the moon or the stars, he created light, which that was kind of cool. And we talked about how there's like a hundred billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy, and how astronomers believe that there's over a hundred billion galaxies in the world. We, we read the verse that, that uh, Pastor Randy Alcorn says is the most understated statement in all of history, That's the, the phrase that says, and he also created the stars. And that drives Randy Alcorn crazy, just like the stars are amazing, and it just gets like five words. And we talked about how, Nate talked about how the sun is so powerful that if we don't hang curtains in our windows, it will damage our furniture. And the sun is 93 million miles away. It takes light over eight minutes to get to our homes, but still we have to cover our windows to protect our floors and to protect our furniture. And we talked about seed-bearing plants, and Nate talked about how the average strawberry has 200 seeds and the potential of a seed. You remember, if, if you were here last week, it was awesome, this glorious picture of creation. And we get all the way to the middle of day six. And God is, is looking out on his creation, and he sees the trillions of stars. He, we, we sang a song last week after the message that, w- that said something about a thousand hallelujahs, and then I'll sing a thousand more. And I was so into it. I was loving it. But as we sang those words, I hope led us in that song. It's beautiful. But I was just thinking, <laughs> that's not enough. A thousand is like, seems so pitiful compared to how awesome God is. That's what I was thinking. I don't know if, I was thinking like, so we measure things with inches and feet or centimeters and meters, and God's measuring things with light years. God's measuring things with, with numbers that have so many zeros on them, we don't have vocabulary with how to describe them. And so here he is in the middle of day six, and he's looking out at all these planets and all of these stars and all of these sea creatures and, and, and animals that are running on the, on, on the, on the ground and, and birds that are flying in the air, and everything is made good and everything is perfect, and God says, something's missing. Something's missing. And so he saves the best for last. And so what's in creation, when we get to, mid, to the midway point of day six, is the testimony of the creator, right? Creation is doing exactly what God created it to do. It's testifying to his majesty. It's testifying to his creativity, to his wonder. The psalm says the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens are are communicating to us how majestic our God is. Romans 1 says that that because of creation, that God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen. 
because we can see his testimony, his, his handiwork in creation, but something's missing. Creation has his testimony, but creation is missing his image. And so he creates the image of God. He creates mankind. And it is completely different than what Lawrence Krauss says in the video. The story of Genesis 1 is the universe is not an accident. The universe is not purposeless. The universe has a purpose. It has been appointed by God to declare to everyone of his glory. And you and I have an incredible purpose. And it's not about what we determine in our hearts. It's about the purpose that God has appointed to us. What he's given us, it's all wrapped up in the image of God. And scholars have been using the Latin phrase imago Dei for a long, long time to refer to the image of God. So I might say that some imago Dei is Latin for image of God. You've probably heard that. It's probably a church that you know of that's called the imago Dei or something. So that's the image of God. There's tremendous purpose and value wrapped up in the image of God. And I want to say tonight, there is no greater value than to, be, than to be made in the image of God. So what does it mean to be created in his image? Okay, let's look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. So right away, our attention is being drawn to this moment. Because if you have, if, if you read through Genesis 1, there's a pattern. Like every day there's, there's a pattern, and it kind of goes like this. God says, let there be, and fill in the blank. Let there be light. Let there be an expanse between this. Let there be this. And then it happens, and then God kind of evaluates it, says that it's good, and then there's evening and there's morning, day one. Then let there be, it happens, evaluates, it's good. The next day, you know, and on and on. But then we get to the midway point of day six. And God doesn't say, let there be. God says, let's have a conversation about this. You see that? He says, let us make man in our image. It's plural. So there's a lot of you can read a lot about what that phrase means. For example, one, one line of thinking is that it's the council of, of the heavens. It's the, it's the divine council. So it's God's gathering all the angels, and he's gathering them together. He's like, okay, to cap this off, let us make man in our image. I'm, that's not where I'm at, I just because angels didn't have any part of creation. I think the, the traditional way in the church, and I think it's still the best explanation that it's the Trinity, it's the, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, the Spirit that's hovering over the water, that they're in this community, the Godhead speaks and says, let us make man in our image. So it's like, here's the, here's the pinnacle of creation, the climax of creation. It's kind of like God saying, this time, this time, we're going to swing for the fence. Let us make man in our image. By the way, the Hebrew word for man is Adam, it's Adam, and it can mean mankind, so humanity, or it can mean a man. It kind of depends on the article that precedes it, it kind of depends on the context. In Genesis 1, whenever it says man, that Adam, it means mankind. So when we read man, when some of yours might say mankind, we're talking about men and women. When we get to Genesis 2, it's singular. Now we'll, be there, we'll be there soon. We'll be in Genesis 2 soon. So, so when I'm saying man, we're talking about humanity, mankind. Let us make man, mankind in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, and the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. Here it is. He created them male and female. How do we explain what the image of God is? Flip ahead to chapter 5, verse 3. Adam was 130 years old 
when he fathered a son in his likeness according to his image and named him Seth. So he uses the same language, the same phrase in chapter 5, verse 3, as he does in 1, 26, and 27. So I think it would be right, as we think about what is the image of God, to think about it and how a child reflects his or her parents. And so there's a lot of definitions out there on the image of God. I'm just going to try to keep it really simple and, and just try to keep stay here in, in Genesis 1. I was talking about this uh, yesterday, texting and, and emailing back and forth with Tanner Bumgard, and he sent me his thoughts, so I'm going to steal your thoughts, Tanner, and use your words. But here's how I would define image of God, and these are Tanner's words. But that we are, that we are created in the image of God means that we were created to reflect and to represent God, to reflect God in that we are like God, kind of like a, a son might look like and have the same uh, attributes as his dad, we are like God. We're made to reflect God and to represent God. We're made to bring honor and glory to God. So when God is looking out over his creation and he's like, I want to, I, I need my image to be there, which by the way, the word image is um, selim in the, in the Old Testament. The nations around Israel, the, the, the kings, the Pharaoh, the, they would call themselves God. They would call themselves the image of God. And they would put up statues of themselves and would call them selim which means image, icon. And they were all over the ancient world. And God, when he started this culture and said, I want you to follow my ways, he gave them a command, don't make an idol, don't make an image for me. And one of the reasons why is because God's image was already in the world. The word for image in Genesis 1 is selim, the same word that's in the ancient world for those statues of the image of God, of the, the rulers of the surrounding nations. And in Genesis 1 says, you are my image. You are my likeness. My image, my representatives. So, what does that mean for us today in 2023? That we are made, that mankind is made in the image of God. It means a lot. <laughs> uh, we're not going to exhaust the subject, but I want to talk about three gifts that come with being the Imago Dei. Three gifts that come with being the Imago Dei. The first one, I won't spend much time on this, but the first gift that we get for being in the Imago Dei is humility. The very essence of an image means that there is something more real than the image. As uh, author Henry Bloker says in his book, an image is only an image. It exists only by derivation. It is not the original, nor is it anything without the original. The exact opposite of what Lawrence Krauss said in the video. He's saying the universe is meaningless. All we have is whatever we can figure out for purpose. And by being in the image of God, Bloker saying we have no meaning apart from the original. We derive meaning not from ourselves, but from our creator, from the one that we are made to reflect. Mankind's being an image stresses the radical nature of his dependence. Like what Brian talked about when he introduced this series, that God is fiercely independent. He's the only one in all the universe. Everything in all the universe derives its meaning from him. Everything else is creaturely. Everything else is created. Everything else is dependent on him. He is the only one that is independent. And so part of being in the image of God, it's like a gift that God has given us of humility. It doesn't depend on you. Life, meaning, purpose does not depend on you. And there's something about that for me that's really peaceful. It kind of takes the pressure off. It's a gift of the Imago Dei. It's humility. Second gift of the Imago Dei is dignity. <laughs> we are the pinnacle of God's creation.
his favorite part. He created light. And light travels at 186,000 miles a second. A minute, yeah, a second. He created planets that are spinning right now, sending sounds throughout creation. He created comets and novas and nebula that send brilliant colors throughout the universe. He created the chicken that poops breakfast, <laughs> according to Nate Sapp. He created everything perfect, but none of those things are created in his image. He didn't breathe his breath into those things. But he did to mankind. He breathed his very breath into us. There's something about this moment right now, just if I'm being honest with you, that's really frustrating for me because I don't know how to say this. I don't, like, this is so huge. The fingerprint of God is on your life. The very fingerprint, the reflection of God, you are made to reflect him, to represent him. His fing the fingerprint of Yahweh is on each one of you. Elohim. His fingerprint is on you. And I think we can come to a message like last week and we can see pictures of the stars and pictures of the galaxy and be like, wow, that's awesome. Wow, God is so majestic. Wow, God is so creative. I mean, think about this nine trillion light years across and it's expanding rapidly and it's full of beauty. My God is amazing. And we can see videos of like whales swimming through the ocean or, or the, the power of an alligator's mouth or the power of a, of a shark or watch a gazelle, you know, loping through the plains. Or we, we see beauty like that and we're overwhelmed. We're like, I want to sing. I want to worship because I'm just reminded of how majestic and how brilliant and how beautiful my God is. And we can see the, the, the sky just get Riddled with six, seven, eight different colors when the sun sets. We can drive to Colorado and see the snow-capped mountains, or we can see the rolling hills and just be like, God is so adventuresome. He's so amazing. I love him. I want to worship him. Yes, 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 God is good. God is powerful. God is independent. And we can get behind that. I think, I think pretty easy. But what happens when you look in the mirror? Can you look in the mirror and say, God is good? Because when God sees you, he is so proud. When he sees you, it's like that's pride and joy. That's the best part of my creation. Peter talks about how angels, he said, he said when we get to heaven someday, angels are going to come to us and they're going to inquire about being made new in Christ. Can you imagine the angel Gabriel running and tracking you down and grabbing you in heaven and saying, tell me, what was it like to experience grace? What was it like to be made new? To have this angelic being say, I, I look up to you, I want to know about you, like, what was it like? Being the Imago Dei, it's a gift of dignity, honor. And we love it, right? We love it when we see humility and confidence come together. It's awesome. And so I love it that the Imago Dei gives us humility and confidence, humility and dignity. We, my wife and I, our, our family was taking care of some kids for a, a friend the other day. And one of these kids is about this big. And he is uh, nonverbal. Um, still wearing diapers, he can't eat, so he still drink, drinks milk from a bottle. 
Uh, he, he likes to make gagging sounds. I think it feels good on his throat. One morning, he was, he was sleeping on the floor next to my bed, and I wake up at like 5 in the morning to the sound of gagging. He's just chilling, just making these noises. So my wife takes him to his, his afternoon, like preschool, and they drive up to the parking lot, open the door, and she gets him out, and he sees the preschool, and his whole body just goes limp, and he starts screaming, causing a scene. So the teacher comes out to help. My wife says, is this, does he do this sometimes? The teacher says he does this all the time. And as we, just the, the, the vibe that I was getting as we were caring for this boy is that there's a lot of people around his life that when they look at him, they just see work. And so we'd given him a bath one evening, he got his PJs on, we made his little bed next to our bed, and so I laid down next to him just to talk to him a little bit, and I'm, I'm rubbing his back, and I'm, and I'm preparing, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the image of God, and so I'm, I'm like laying, like talking to this, this young boy and, and um, thinking about he's in the image of God, and at one point, I just reached my hand to his face, and I, and I rubbed the side of his face like that, and I just, and I said, you are a good boy, and he smiled, ear to ear, smiled, and something came alive in my heart that a, that a, a Chiefs playoff win can't really get, <laughs> that, a, that a Cats basketball win, it can't really get it, and I was laying there thinking, you're the image of God, so I Googled this morning, the, the most expensive animal ever paid for, and I found this picture of um, Fusaichi Pegasus. He won the Kentucky Derby in 2000, and the bill of sale was closed, so you couldn't, it wasn't made public, but the news said it was somewhere between 60 and $70 million that was paid for Fusaichi Pegasus. It's a good-looking horse. And I'm telling you, this young boy that can't speak, that can't use the bathroom in the bathroom, that can't eat, that just screams really loud when he doesn't, when he doesn't know how to communicate what he wants, he's of infinite more value than Fusaichi Pegasus. Infinite more value. Why? Because he's in the image of God. Fusaichi Pegasus is a horse. You are valuable. And it doesn't matter how well you perform. That's not what makes you valuable. It doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what your ACT is. It doesn't matter which sorority you got into or which sorority that didn't accept you. It doesn't matter which fraternity that you're in. Doesn't matter which internship you landed or you didn't land, you are valuable because you are made in the likeness of God. You have dignity. And I'm trying to say that with passion. And I don't think I'm getting close to saying it the way it should be said. You've been given humility and you've been given dignity. And there's one more thing that I want to mention. And this, this, is, this is the, oh man. The third gift of the, the Imago Dei is purpose. He's given you purpose. In other words, I don't buy into what Lawrence Krauss is preaching. There's meaning in the universe. And God has appointed you. And he's given you purpose. And here's what it is. He wants his image in this world. He wants his image in creation. He wants agents of his likeness in this world. And so he's created you, every one of you, to be in this world to reflect him and to represent him. And so we reflect him because we're like him. So how are we like him? 
Well, we're not completely like him because we're not God. Remember, we're, we're just the image. But we are complex. We can think and reason and use logic. You see Adam doing this in chapter 2 in the next chapter as he's looking at all the animals. He's trying to find a suitable mate for him so that he can procreate. And he's looking at all of them saying, nope, 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 nope. He's using logic. He's using reason. In fact, let's read that. Verse 28. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So here's the first great commission. Some of you that have been around, you know the great commission in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples of all nations. Well, here it is in Genesis 1. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. And God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you. All those things that Nate talked about last week, they're for us to rule, to have dominion over, to cultivate. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything that having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. We reflect God. In other words, we are like him and that we are complex. He breathed life into us. We are a combination of body and spirit come together in one being. We exercise creativity. That's different from the rest of creation. We can learn. We can, we can use logic. And so I know animals can learn. There's a, I was reading about this in Grudem's Systematic Theology book, and I thought this was kind of a fun thing that he said about it. So I, I, I put this up here for you. He says, animals sometimes exhibit remarkable behavior in solving mazes or working out problems in the physical world, but they do not engage in abstract reasoning. There is no such thing as the history of canine philosophy. I thought that was funny. For example, nor have any animals since creation developed at all in their understanding of ethical problems or use of philosophical concepts. No group of chimpanzees will ever sit around a table arguing about the doctrine of the Trinity or the relative merits of Calvinism or Arminianism. In fact, even in developing physical and technical skills, we are far different from animals. Beavers still build the same kind of dams that they have built for a thousand generations. Birds still build the same kind of nests. And bees still build the same kind of hives. But we continue to develop greater skill and complexity and technology in agriculture, in science, and nearly every other field of endeavor. We reflect God. We are not just a mammal. We are not just one step above the Nebraska man. We are the image of God. We don't just reflect, or maybe I should say it like this way. We not only reflect God in creation, but we also represent him in his creation. God, like, he, he created us relational. We have the ability and the longing for um, complex relationships and long, uh, long-term relationships. God speaks to us. He listens to us like we relate to him. He created us to value depth of community. In that relationship, he commands us to multiply and to rule and to reign. We see Adam ruling when he names the animals in chapter 2. Adam and Eve coming together to create, to multiply. Sex is part of the perfect plan of God. Right here in Genesis 1, before sin ever enters the world... God says, I made male and female, and I want you to come together and multiply and fill the earth. He's talking about sex. Part of our image of God is our sexuality. It's like one of the first things he says. 
you're in, you're in my image, male and female. So he's, when he's saying, I created mankind, he, he's not saying, I created man in my image and then I created women. He's saying, I created man and woman in my image, equal before God, equal status before God, men and women, both fashioned in the likeness of God, both in the image of God. Now, we're very different. And we talk about differences of men and women in chapter 2, but we're not in chapter 2. The emphasis of chapter 1 is that we're equal before God. We're reigning together in Genesis 1, equal in status and value. So we're called to represent him in how we act, how we treat others, how we deal with our sexuality. We are called to represent him in how we rule and exercise dominion. So listen, how we treat nature, how we treat the planet is not a political issue. How we treat the planet is an image of God issue. He's commanded us to rule and reign and steward the earth. How we treat animals is an Imago Day issue. How we treat the opposite sex is an Imago Day issue. I, I, I'm going through this way too fast, but I just want to f- close with talking about this. We have a real enemy, Satan. And he hates the image of God. And he's doing everything he can to destroy the image of God. So God says, you're the apple of my eye. You're the favorite part of creation. I've created you with dignity. And here comes the enemy. If I can get that person to live in their failure, what if I can get that person to scroll Instagram for an hour every day and just compare, just compare? My story's not as good as that story. My pictures aren't as good as that picture. I don't have that many likes. If I can just get that person, to, if I can just kind of bury dignity and not get that person to, to walk in the humility and the dignity that the image of God has gifted them with. large, it's estimated today that there are roughly 50 million slaves in the world. Slavery is wicked, evil, and the enemy is using slavery to destroy the image of God. Frederick Douglass escaped slavery here in America He ended up becoming an advisor to Abraham Lincoln. And he, in his first paper, his first abolitionist paper, when he's, he learned to read and to write, and he tried to to educate people and help people to see the, the, the horrors of slavery. And in his first abolitionist paper, he says, right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. Do you hear it? Do you hear it in his language? It's the Imago Dei. Right doesn't depend on gender, sex. Truth doesn't depend on color. We are all in the image of God. You want to know what undergirded the abolitionist movement? It's the doctrine of the Imago Dei. We all have value. Equal value. We're all made with the thumbprint of Yahweh on our lives. Racism is an image of God issue. To treat someone differently because of the color of their skin is to dishonor the dignity of the image of God. But the enemy's 
trying to attack that. The enemy is attacking our sexuality. A large percentage of those 50 million slaves in the world today are in some kind of sex slavery. Pornography is training our minds. It's training our minds to objectify people. It's training our minds to not think about people as the Imago Dei, but to think about them as objects of flesh and objects of pleasure. And as the pornography rates increase, abuse increases, slavery increases, broken families increase. There's so much confusion in our culture around our sexuality. There's so much brokenness. What if we could get this doctrine of the Imago Dei in our hearts? If we could be anchored to it. What do we learn here in Genesis 1 about our sexuality? We learn that our sexuality is good, that it images God, that men and women both are created in the image of God. And you don't need to be married to be valuable. Single women, single men, married women, married women, all valuable because we get our value from the image of God, not by our marriage status. We'll talk more about that in two or three weeks. But I just want to say this, pornography is sabotaging a lot of your marriages. Because it's taken the legs out of the Imago Dei. Pornography is sabotaging the sex life that you want in your marriage. It's not enhancing it. It's sabotaging it. Because we're more than our bodies. I think I, I shared this last year, and I don't expect you to remember that, but I remember last January, I was, I was in New Orleans, and I was walking down the Bourbon Street, and one of the bars had a sign in there that said, relax. It's just a little sex. And I got so angry. Because it's not just a little sex. He, it, says, a little, no, it says a little sex never hurt anybody. That's what it says. I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't know that I know anybody who hasn't been wounded at some level by, by the Imago Dei, our sexuality being attacked. It's wounded everybody, all of us, at varying levels. That's what I thought when I was walking down the street. I got so mad. We are more than our bodies. We are complicated creatures. We have spirit. We have soul. We have we have emotions, and so when you join with somebody, you know, physically, it's not just a body is coming together. It's, it's a person and a person coming together. It's the image of God. Sexuality is an image of God issue. Last thing I want to mention is abortion. The Bible talks about the life of the preborn. Psalm 139 talks about how God created us, and he planned our steps. He knit us together before we were born. Jeremiah 1, and God calls Jeremiah to ministry. He, he calls him before he's even born. It's like, I knew you when you were in the womb. I set you apart to be my prophet. The Bible values life at conception. When conception happens, there's already like a unique DNA. Roe v. Wade, when it, when it, um, when it said that the Constitution inferred the right to have an abortion, I'm talking about Roe v. Wade from 1973, not that it was just overturned last year. That's 50 years ago. We have learned so much about life in the womb since 19. We're learning more and more. I mean, you've seen it, right? You've seen 3D images of sonograms. They're amazing. You've seen the way these babies move and, and interact in the womb. In a recent Newsweek article, Newsweek talks about this. So scientific advance, this is Newsweek. Scientific advances time and again affirm that the unborn are nothing less than human. As early as five weeks, unborn babies have a heartbeat. 
blood vessels are forming and their brains and spinal cords are beginning to develop. By 10 weeks, the baby has arms, legs, fingers, and toes, can kick, and will jump if startled. By 15 weeks, babies in the womb have fully developed hearts, pumping 26 quarts of blood per day, along with fully formed noses, lips, eyelids, and eyebrows. They can taste and make facial expressions. John, kick up, swallow, suck their thumbs. Almost their entire body responds to a light touch and painful sensations trigger a hormonal stress response. This is at 15 weeks. The more science discovers, the more the Bible has proved right. One pastor I was listening to was talking about this. He says that in the abortion debate, the narrative used to be that it's not a person. The baby's not a person. It's, It's an embryo. It's, uh, it's just a, a, a clump of cells. But as science has gotten advanced, the pro-choice argument has moved from that to a woman's rights. A woman's rights are more important than the unborn baby. So I'm kind of nervous to talk about this. but I think we should talk about it. I'm guessing there are some in this room that have had an abortion. And I'm guessing there's some in this room that maybe you haven't had an abortion, but you've helped someone have one. And so I'm not bringing this up to throw shame. I'm not bringing this up to throw condemnation. I'm guessing that there's some of you here that are addicted to pornography or you're addicted to some kind of hookup culture. And so for me to get up here and and rant on about how pornography is sabotaging your marriage and you're thinking to yourself, that does not help me at all. I don't want to do this. I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. But you telling me that it's sabotaging, I know that. I'm guessing some of you are in that camp. So I'm not, I'm not bringing these things up to throw condemnation. I'm bringing them up to say these are Imago Day issues. And we need the doctrine of the Imago Day to anchor us in these times. So if, if you are here and abortion's part of your story, I, everybody in this room, one, We are all image bearers of God. And two, we are all totally messed up. Nobody in this room has it together. And if abortion is part of your story and you've never told anybody, I hate it that you're carrying that around. And we would love to share that burden with you. We'd love to talk. If you're here and sexual addiction is part of your story, that's why we're doing these SRG groups. We want to help. It's a, there's a war out there. There's a fight involved in knowing and loving and walking with God. Let me pray for us as the band comes up. Father, we just look to you and we thank you it's it's amazing to me this whole thing of how you've created and it's amazing to me that you have put your your uh, your touch in our lives and that something about each of us here represents you and reflects you So, God, I know that the evil one does not like us talking about this. The evil one does not want us to believe this. And so I just ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would quiet the whispers of the enemy. I pray that you'd fill this room full of courage. 
those that need to bring sin that is holding them back, that is, that is, that is kind of hiding their image-bearing status with you. It's kind of burying it, that they need to kind of bring that into the light. I pray that you'd fill this room full of courage so that those things could be brought into the light and that freedom could be found. I pray you'd fill this room with just a feeling of grace. Protect these image bearers in this room from shame. Shame's the devil's playground. We don't want to stay in shame. So God, we ask for us to be able to taste your grace. We ask for courage. We ask that you would show us a path forward to help us to step into and believe who you have created us to be. And that we, that those in this room, that we would do, that we would honor you with how we reflect you and we'd honor you in how we represent you. Lord, we ask that you'd be, you'd be God in our hearts in these moments as we respond in worship. And if somebody needs to talk or somebody needs to share, somebody needs to pray, Lord, we, we ask that you'd be God in their hearts and in our hearts in those moments.